So I would like to welcome you to this exploration of a bit of a little dive into the power of using metaphors with your clients. Um, and I'd also really be curious what brought people to this uh, this live today. What brought you here, as far as what you're what you're hoping to get from today? And you can either speak it or you can type it into the chat. And thank you, Karen. Yeah, when you're camping, you know, I'm glad you're here. Um, no camera is necessary when you're camping. So a refresher, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a refresher for some people. Anything else that people are hoping to get? <laughs> I'm just going to go with a the refresher then. Um, recently a fan of the work from YouTube and excited to learn more about the idea of using metaphors in coaching. Excellent. Well, we will see what you do. And um, here we go. So... When you think about metaphors and coaching, um, th there's, I, I really want you to start thinking in the way of the neuroscience. I'm gonna start with that of metaphors and do sort of a high level discussion around this. But the research really started in the 70s with, um, with some pioneers who were really looking into the visual languaging that people did and what, they discovered and what they continued studying through the 80s and then into the 90s and then into the 2000s are there four conceptual metaphors that tend to really light up different regions of the brain. And these four conceptual metaphors have to do with thinking is eating or food, thinking is vision or seeing, thinking is manipulating things, manipulation, and thinking is moving. And when you think back to early humans, when you think about the things that were required in order for us to survive the landscape that we found ourselves in, eating, moving, manipulating, and seeing are all big parts of our brain. And so it makes a lot of sense then that these would be the sort of metaphors that all human beings ultimately have access to. And so the other thing that I really love about metaphors is that when a client brings a metaphor up in a conversation and the coach hears the metaphor that the client brought forward, what that tells the coach is that something has lit up the client's brain. We don't know what, but it's an opportunity to really start to test our hypotheses about what that is. But we'll hear certain metaphors that are really powerful and impactful. And, and it'll be an opportunity for the coach to begin getting curious with the client. A couple of things that metaphors do from a perspective of of the neuroscience of it, number one, because by giving some clarity of distance, we're not now talking about your overwhelm and how stressed out you are and how terrible things are and trying to solve for your problem. Now we're talking about something that might feel like juggling or an overflowing plate, right? And, and from the lens of the overflowing plate uh, for overwhelm, we're not like trying to solve anything. Now we're just looking at this plate. How would you like this plate to look? And it gives the client a lot of a creative freedom to explore fully the ideas that are kind of unconscious within their brain and it, and it doesn't have to be explained to the coach, right? We're all pretty familiar. If anybody's ever had any big celebratory meal in their life, we're all pretty familiar with an overflowing plate, right? And so we don't have to say to the coach, when you say overflowing plate, what do you mean? We can just start to look, use the language that the client has brought forward immediately and access that region of the brain that just got lit up by this thinking is eating or food or something to that effect, right? So I'm going to share a slide with you guys as we're as we're looking at these um these metaphors and let's see here so um i wonder if i can like 
it'll be too big if I do it in the other way. So I'm going to just do this. So here are the four conceptual metaphors. And it came out of some work by Eve Switzer and Alan Schwartz, but it also is coming out of the work of Lakoff and Johnson. And they did, they continued the work in 1999, where they were really looking at fMRIs to see where activation was happening in the brain. And what they discovered was all of these four conceptual metaphors really light up the brain of the client. And so as a coach, when you're sitting in a conversation with a client, clients will often bring forward conversations in this sort of way. And so this is an example maybe of agreement setting here. Coach asks, you know, what would be different at the end of our conversation if we uh, fully explore these ideas that you've been wrestling with, um, been wrestling around with? And the client responds with, most of the time, I just power through things. But that only works in moments where you feel like you have the energy to do so. So one area that I'm really struggling with are doubts, uh, uh, struggling with is if those doubts of are particularly strong and I'm not feeling energetic and I'm not feeling strong, they may win out for the day or for a few days. And, um, you know, and it's hard, you know, right? And so as a coach, I'm hearing this struggle that is occurring and I'm also, and, and I'm also hearing that it's decreasing energy. So I know she's wrestling with something, right? Because she's being really clear about that. And it's sucking her energy. So I have an opportunity in this particular situation to clarify with the client, right? And so we look at ICF competency of agreement setting. We want to get to what's important. We want to understand what the client wants to work on. But we also want to start to create the container of a coaching conversation, right? And so in this particular agreement setting element, I'm able to say, if I'm hearing correctly, I'm hearing a movement from this sort of powering through, you know, towards having more ease, maybe, because she's, she's struggling with something. I'm testing a hypothesis. I don't know that I'm right. At that point, the client will say, yes, that's it. I'm, you know, it's this wrestling to ease, or they may say, no, it's something completely different. But what we're doing is we're, we're leveraging their language. We're leveraging where their brain has already lit up. And as I'm saying that, what's showing up for folks, and I'm going to stop sharing real quick and just sort of get a sense from you guys what you're, what you're hearing and, and what sort of questions are starting to arise for you. And you can put it in the chat if you want. <laughs> you feel your metaphor. Somebody said they felt like metaphors are their spirit animal. I think they're my spirit animal too. <laughs> What sort of questions are showing up as you think about utilizing the metaphors that show up in a conversation to maybe create agreement setting or to evoke awareness or to just even recognize that the client's brain has just lit up on something? I appreciate, uh, this is Falanda. I appreciate um, that example as um, I'm connecting to what you said earlier, like I'm not seeking as the coach to gain clarity on the metaphor for my sake. What I noticed in that example was like the question posed to the client was for their purpose. Like, let's get clarity about what it means to you and let me get a high level clarity so I can help you move closer to your point of deepened understanding. Right. And I think that's a really great, that's a really lovely way of saying it, because what I want to do is I want to know where the client wants to go. So sort of using an analogy, all of you are coming one of you at one at a time, but you're all coming to my house and we're going to go off and we're going to do we're going to do something, right? And so you've just driven up to my house and we've said our hellos and we've gotten into your car. What is the first question that you're probably going to ask me? I'm going to be very quiet until somebody gives me an idea. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Can we play Beyonce? <laughs> and I'd be like, sure. Um, but most likely you're going to say, where are we going? 
right? Is that going to come up at some point in before we ever leave my driveway? Where are we going? What's the next question you're going to ask after where are we going? Do you know where I live? Do you know how to get around? How do we get there? And it's really no different than in coaching. How long will it take? What are we going to do when we get there? What will I see? What should I expect, right? Yeah, how will we get there? Absolutely. And so, so this is really what we're doing in agreement setting. The client comes to us and they often tell us in the first really five minutes of a conversation when we start asking them, what do you want to talk about today? What's up for you to explore? They often tell us and we often don't hear them because we're not listening to their, their deeper language. And so Andy, you asked a question about which metaphor are you supposed to pay attention to? Is that what you would put in here? I think I saw something. How many metaphors do I miss? I don't know. Do you record your do you record your coaching sessions? How many people here and just put it in the chat? How many people here record their coaching sessions and then go back and do a transcript analysis of their coaching? <laughs> I hear sometimes um, I have been lately. Um, not since school. And that's it, right? Like not since school. I'm going to just bring up something for you guys. And I am going to, um, I'm not going to share my failed LinkedIn live with you, but I'm going to share something else with you that I think will be very useful. So let me get to it really quickly. And then I will, um, I will Share it. So hold on. Sorry, I've got to find it real quick. So I'm going to go into one of these YouTube videos. Um, so this is one that I have for YouTube so I can share this process. But what I want to do is show you what we start to what we're starting to look for when we have um, um, a client who is showing up and um, we're listening for what's going on. So she and I had a little bit of a hiccup in the beginning. And so I'm aware I um, forgot to read what she sent me. So note to coaches, if your client sends you their stuff, read it. Um, that's really highly, that's, that's my free gift to you today. Um, but right here, we um, start going into, um, I won't complicate it any further than what is showing up for you today that would be important to explore. Thank you, Lisa. It, uh, I would like to explore um, uh, two things. I did write, it was energy. And I guess energy can be anything. How I define energy is there's physical energy and emotional energy. So it's calibrating to, you know, higher energy and what throws me off and how hard it is to recalibrate to a higher energy. And I'm not, I, an energy, I don't mean like, you know, excitement, not even joy, just equanimity. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. How, I mean, we're, how many metaphors are just in the one, like one little thing that she's talking about, right? She's already talking about calibration. We talk about manipulation, right? Calibration is a form of manipulation. I, I know already calibrating is important. I'm also hearing energy, physical energy, emotional energy. Energy is um, a very visual sort of language. It doesn't necessarily fit specifically into um, a metaphorical stance, but it can because what is higher energy? Right. It's this experience of I'm moving from one type of energy towards another type of energy. So we're seeing a movement and a progress that's already starting. And this is in the it's only three minutes because we were chit chatting ahead of time and I forgot to read what she sent me. Um, so I was being a bad coach. But my response then is to feed her back her language to see what resonates for her. So. So I'm hearing you correctly, it's really a calibration of energy that's important to explore today. 
when you consider where you are right now energetically and where you would like to maybe be energetically by the end of our conversation, what do you notice? I notice that I would, I notice and I feel that I'd like to have uh, equi not equanimity, uh, empathy comes up for me as a place to go because I do not explore empathy for myself. I'm very, very good for other people. So somehow there's a connection with empathy for self and calibrating to, or maybe empathy when I'm not where I want to be. Right, right. You mentioned a couple of things regarding the empathy, the calibration of empathy to energy, and then also empathy with yourself when you're not being, I don't know, empathetic with yourself. <laughs> empathy when you're not being empathetic. Um, oh. what, what, I mean, and it doesn't have to be either of those two things, but as I say that, what shows up as a place to explore? So what are you noticing that I'm, I'm paying attention to in this conversation? And I can't her, see the chat. Her words. So. Her words, Lissa. Yeah. Her words are crucially important. Why? If we're thinking about what lights up the brain and how neuroscience works with people, what do I do for the client when I hold the space by utilizing their words? It helps them clarify in their brain maybe what they mean, right? I mean, yes, two things come up. One, she's feeling judgmental and she's the judger, the hyperachiever, right? Yeah. It, and, and she doesn't have to change her brain state to explain it to me. How many times have we asked our clients to explain what they mean? And we get lost in the details of what the situation is. And they're explaining about that versus she's starting to talk about like, I mean, this is brilliant because this is where the next metaphor really shows up that I need to be paying attention to. Two things come up. One is when I'm feeling very uh, judgmental on myself, critical, all low energy, mm -hmm. um, low vibration, uh, Critic, critic, the judger, the hyperachiever, and the stickler. Mm -hmm. All hanging out, having a party. <laughs> you know, if you know me at all, but she's just given me this huge opening. We now have a party, and it's not a fun one. And it's a party that sounds a bit depleting. And if you were to move to a party that was energetic, what, what would that party be like? Well, who would be showing up to the energetic party? Wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here it is. I hang out too much. I, not the, this eye, the other eye. <laughs> hang out a lot with that. And this is the part I don't know so much when I get there. So to answer your question about the party over on the other place would be, one would be an empathizer. Mm -hmm. I don't, I would like to explore that. Okay. Who would be on the other, who would be balancing this way or tilting this way? Do you now see she has like got all kinds of metaphors showing up. She's actually beginning to embody this experience that she wants. She's looking for, she was looking for balance. She's looking at these two parties. We can now start this exploration. And I think, you know, um, here's the question that's my follow-up, which is that really the completion of my agreement setting also. Yeah. 
So then as you consider this move from the critical party yes. towards the empathetic party, what is, what is the right place to begin exploring? Like, where would you like to start? And now I've just turned it over to the client. Now that I have a sense of where do you want to go? What's important about that? What are we exploring? What, where do, you know, now we got parties we're looking at. Oh, I like looking at parties, you know, because, and it isn't as, it isn't as scary if we're looking at parties as it is, let's talk about your judger. You know, you need to stop that judging yourself. You shouldn't, you know, you should let that go. People then all of a sudden are feeling judged because trust me, um, I was having a, um, I was having a mentor coaching session with somebody not that long ago. And as we were talking, she said something that was really interesting. She says, as you're telling me this, what I'm hearing is the client isn't actually even talking to us. They are talking to themselves. And I said, I think that's exactly right. The client is talking to themselves. Our job is to hear what it is that they say that's important. And often the way people describe really important things is through this concept of idea containers. And that's what metaphors are. They are an idea container. So thinking is moving. I am moving through this landscape somehow. I'm moving from this energy to that energy, right? Thinking is food or thinking is eating. You know, I'm having to digest this and it's hard. It's a, it's, this is a hard pill to swallow, right? I don't know. I don't have to know exactly what the hard pill is. I know I've swallowed a hard pill in my day and it didn't feel good. It was really uncomfortable, right? And you're like petting your neck, trying to get it to go down. We can have empathy with the embodied experience that they are in the midst of having at that moment with, and metaphors allow us to hold the container in a safe and we're not doing therapy. We're just holding the container, we're utilizing the client's language. We're following where they lead us. So when you start to think of the competencies and you think of this idea of agreement setting, I mean, I spent some time. I explored what things meant. And then I got, you know, this sense of clarity. And I asked the client, is this what we're doing? And then where would you like to begin? So that the client is empowered to lead me through this conversation. And if any of you have ever seen the um, program or the training that I did on, you know, the speed of trust or, you know, trust and safety and coaching conversations, I talk about that idea of I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really unable, I don't, I'm not, I can't see their landscape. So I have to trust them by putting my hand on their shoulder and having them lead me through their landscape, not me leading them through their landscape. How would it even be possible that any more possible than you coming to my house without a GPS and just knowing where to take me, where I want to go without me having to say anything, right? So I'm seeing some things in um, the chat. So I want to I wanna kind of touch base with people. Um, you know, uh, mirroring back to people, um, that this is interesting how it embodies things. And when you think about it, I mean, metaphors are things that we can, we do feel. If I say, you know, it's like lemon in the wound. Who here doesn't know what that experience is? Unless you've never been around a citrus uh, and ever cut yourself. Um, or I was uh, working with a Chinese client at one point and I said, you know, as you're talking, we were, she wanted to, she was writing a book and she wanted to talk about what was getting in the way of her writing this book because she kept sitting there and not writing. And I had said, it's almost like I'm hearing you say there's like this path you want to explore in this conversation today. And she goes, oh no, it's not a path. She goes, in China, we say you cross a river by feeling the stone. And if, if anybody, and I know some people here are from Alaska, if anybody's ever been walking through a river, they're rarely really smooth on the bottom. You have to feel stones as you're crossing and the water looks smooth, but it's got a current usually. So there's a tension that has to be paid, right? And I said, you know, that's a, an incredibly beautiful metaphor, but is that what we're doing today is in our conversation, are we crossing a river? And she said, yeah, I think we are. And I said, what is the first stone we need to feel? 
And I just use her language and she doesn't have to explain it to me. She gets to stay in her own brain. Her own neurocircuitry is alive and I am joining her where she is versus asking her to come to me. And this is something that coaches do a lot. The client gives the metaphor. And there was an example of this in one of my classes. Um, the client said, easily four times, I am lost in the weeds. I keep getting lost in the weeds. I'm lost in the weeds. I'm lost in the weeds. And the coach came up with their own metaphor. So it sounds like you're just really confused, you know, and you're just sort of like, I don't know. I don't remember what the metaphor was that she came up with, um, but it wasn't the client's metaphor. And so what ended up happening is you could just see the client getting more and more frustrated and the coach getting more and more like, oh my gosh, I don't know what the right question is because the coach was not hearing the metaphor that the client was bringing forward about being lost in the weeds. And so I said, you know, at the very end of it all, because there was a lot of tension at that point, I said, um, may I have like 15, like five or 10 minutes just to play with you on this, this conversation that just happened after we had done our debrief on it. And I said to the client, I said, so I hear you saying lost in the weeds. And I'm wondering, what's the experience you would be having if you were no longer lost in the weeds? Oh my God, like instantly, his language, right? He's like, oh, if I was not lost in the weeds, it's like my head would be popping up above the, the weeds. And, and he said, I'd be like a gopher. And I'm like, I got to be honest with you, I'm seeing a meerkat, but I don't know if that matters. And he goes, it's a meerkat. And so like he even posted on, you know, LinkedIn, you know, be the meerkat. Like it was so impactful to him. This idea of himself popping up above the weeds, right? This experience. That's the kind of stuff that is then embodied. Clients make sustainable changes when they own their experience, and as coaches, we can support that space for them by listening to their language. And, and by doing that, then it becomes, it's that reflective piece, but it's also, it's honoring what lights up their brain. And, you know, you can always throw out a metaphor to a client that you're noticing for yourself and then just hold it very lightly and loosely. And the client will redirect you towards the metaphor that makes sense to them. But I'll tell you, my experience with clients has typically been, if I hear their metaphor, they feel heard in a very different way than if I'm offering them metaphors. Has anybody here had an experience where somebody heard your metaphor and repeated it back to you and what that did for you? Would you be willing to share, Tracy? Since I see you nodding. Well, I think actually you shared it <laughs> on so, your YouTube. <laughs> it is on YouTube, so you yeah, can see so, Tracy on YouTube. It was um, it was really powerful when you use my analogy, my metaphor, because it it was it was personal to me, and I knew what it meant, and it really was just. Mm, it just enabled me to move forward. I didn't have to explain it to you. I didn't have to bring you into my space or make you understand. And it just let me really look at the problem in a different way. And when you're looking at a plate versus, I mean, just to share just a little bit, since you've already kind of shared it all on YouTube already, um, you know, if you're looking at finishing graduate school, running a pro two programs, running your team, you also have a job, plus you've got your family, plus, 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 plus. And I think you also had puppies at the time. Um, and so, I mean, you've got a lot of things that are showing up in a person's life, right? And so she said, you know, I just have a lot on my plate. And so it's like, well, when you look at this plate, where are places where you might be able to, like, do you need all that stuff on your plate? Is there something you might take off of your plate? And that starts to shift the language. And so the client all of a sudden isn't looking at all these problems, all these terrible challenges to overcome. Now we're just looking at a really full plate. That's not nearly as scary for most people. Right. So what happens to a brain just from a neurological perspective that is feeling fear versus feeling safe? What's the difference? Well, in a fear state, you can't take in new information. You lose your critical thinking. You go into a fight, flight, freeze, fawn. So it's all about survival versus learning, growing, changing, critical thought. Being creative. 
coming up with creative solutions, thinking through things in a new way. It's not possible when you are feeling threat on any level. And whether that threat is a perception of judgment, because we're all talking to ourselves anyway, and we're all super critical of ourselves, and we all don't do it right. And so when the coach then amplifies that by talking about like, let's talk about all things you're not doing well, and how can you stop that and start doing stuff right, you know, it, it sounds good on paper, maybe, but it often on an unconscious level triggers the client to feel less than because they're already feeling overwhelmed by their life and like they're not doing it well or right. And it doesn't take a whole lot to feel like now I've got another person saying that to me and shutting us down. It doesn't take very much judgment at all to end conversations. And in fact, out of the work of, um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with John Gottman's work. He's really one of the foremost re researchers on relationship in the world. And one of the things that he discovered in his work was that it, if, you know, he talks about turning towards, turning away and turning against, um, turning towards away and against. And what he discovered was it only takes like two or three times of bringing something up and feeling shut down by somebody that we never bring it up again. What does that do to the impact of a coaching relationship? Right? How do our clients, like how do they feel safe, heard, understood in a space of exploration and creativity if we bring a, a focus on all the things they're not doing right and how to do them better? Or we get into the semantics of the situation and then they're trying to explain to us a situation that none of us have any control over. Let me tell you about my boss, right? Let me tell you about my boss. You and I don't have any control over the boss. It doesn't almost doesn't matter. What is the what is like as you look at the situation that you're dealing with at work? How would you do, you know? Is there an image that really shows up for you about this experience you're in? I had a client say, you know, it's like he went into this whole thing about a movie, which I cannot remember the movie, but um, you know, and about like this struggle that then was going on in this movie, and that was the thing. It was this. It was the struggle. So if you had a different relationship to the struggle, what would we be shifting? What would we be exploring to shift your perspective on this this particular struggle? What would we be moving towards? And it was moving towards something much lighter. Well, that gives us also, I mean, so then we have a metaphor that's this sort of embodiment of moving towards this idea of freedom. So it becomes almost a metaphorical journey from struggle to freedom. What does freedom mean to you, right? And so at that point, the freedom can mean whatever it means to the client. It's this sense of, you know, it's a lightness. It's a, it's a clarity, right? These things that are around vision and, and the feeling, the, the feeling of movement in, a, in an environment of lightness. And so then once we know where that client wants to go, we now have a roadmap that we can also touch base with them. Anytime we don't know what the next right question is, we can say, where are we in this movement from struggle towards freedom? What else needs to be explored on, the, on, this, uh, on this journey towards freedom? What, what needs to be acknowledged or, you know, or, or played with some more, or just what do you want to anchor for yourself into freedom? And the clients will start naming those things and bringing them into themselves and sharing them with you because their mind is already there. Their brain is already lit up to that space. So I have been talking a tremendous amount. And so I'm going to be quiet now and just sort of see how you guys are doing and what's showing up for you. And I'm going to take a glass of water and drink it. Alyssa, <clears throat> Michelle here. In the chat, Shelly had mentioned that if they are really stuck in the details and aren't using metaphors that we can detect, are there go-to metaphors you can throw out there to, go, to get them to think more creatively or best practices for images that tend to draw people into that space? So great, two great questions and thank you, Michelle. Um, you know, I think um, two really great questions. So I'm just going to 
look at them from my, my lens here, which is, I think what we can do is we can invite clients to, you know, can you tell me more about what this looks like to you? Or what is the experience you're having? Or can you tell me more about integrity, right? Like, what does it mean to be a person of integrity? Or, and because they'll have brought some sort of power words forward. Most clients will use powerful words. And even if it isn't a metaphor specifically, as soon as you ask people to start to describe, how, how do you know you're dealing with somebody of integrity? Or how do you know when you're demonstrating integrity? They'll be like, you know, I feel this in my body and I'm standing up straighter and I, and I feel on top of the world or I feel really good about myself. Um, and, you know, I have a list of a bunch of metaphors that I've heard through the years. And so, you know, um, you, you, you ask, but if you can ask the client to describe it for you, to describe something for you or to describe like, I'm really hearing this lost in the weeds and I'm curious, you know, what would that journey look like if you were to move towards something different where what we're doing is, well, that one, the client gave us that metaphor. In other areas, it may be much more subtle and you may need to just sort of ask them to describe it for you. I don't, and I do sometimes go with sharing a metaphor, but then I, I'm thinking about metaphors as movement, or I'm thinking of them in that sort of way. So I'll often say, you know, it is, is this a path that we're exploring? Or sometimes people will talk about lanes and which lane they need to be in and which lane they don't need to be in. Um, and so I think some of it is really tuning your ears to hear the metaphors that they bring forward, because I have a sense, my guess is that uh, many times they've already shared a metaphor and you haven't captured it, um, which is one of the reasons why I highly recommend um, using a program like Ray Notes, where you can download your transcripts or, or rather your MP3s and and get a transcript that you have to clean up. It's not 100% perfect AI, but they've done a beautiful job also. And I'll just share this real quick also because I think it's so important. Um, but they also have make it very easy for, so like if this is the question and that party sounds a bit depleting, if you were to move to a party that was energetic, what would that party look like? I can go in here and they have all of the competencies right here for me to choose. And so if I'm still in agreement setting, I can come in here and I'm defining what to address. Um, and I've, I'm exploring what's important. And, um, and honestly, I'm also, um, I think this probably has some trust in it because what I'm doing is I'm also partnering with the client to respond, right? Um, I'm, there's probably some listening here. Um, and so I can come down here. It's clearly a customized question. Um, I'm exploring energy shifts specifically because that's exactly what the client is doing, but I'm also exploring her words. I'm inquiring around perception, right? Um, and, and so you can start to go through this and you can start to get a sense of, you know, what competencies you're actually meeting, which is really useful also, because, because the use of the metaphors often in, in conjunction with a simple question hit a lot of the competencies. They hit a lot of the markers. So that you actually are demonstrating more of the markers when you are just asking a simple question versus making it really complicated and adding all your own stuff to it, which takes away from the client. So if you'd like to see how Ray Notes works, yeah, I did a video. There's a link right there. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle's my my assistant who's like the awesomest. Um, but um, it is you know, it's a really great way of starting to notice the metaphors that your clients bring forward. And so I'm going to just stop here. I um, uh, think, yeah, Andy, it's awesome, isn't it? I mean, it really, what it does also when you download it and you can download the competencies that you are hitting and you'll start to see all the evidence of it, but you can also download the competencies that you didn't use that were unmarked, which gives you an opportunity to go, this is a micro 
micro skill I could pay attention to and maybe do a little bit more intentionality around how would I bring that into my coaching. Um, but so everybody who's been here, I'm looking at the time and I want to be um, I want to be conscious of everybody's time and thank you guys all so much for being here. I believe we have caught everybody who's attended in the participation list. And so we will be um, sending you a private message through LinkedIn to sign up for the free drawing that we're going to be doing for the uh, Power of Metaphor certification program. And, um, and so we'll be pulling a name out of a hat for that. So you'll be getting that. But I want to just stop and just what kind of questions are showing up? Has this been useful? Is this, um, is this, is, is this been what you were hoping for? And if not, what do you still need that we can do before we're done? Alyssa, first of all, it's great to see you again. And uh, you, you mentioned something about uh, keeping track of or writing down the metaphors that you come across in uh, discussions, coaching sessions, and so forth. I think that's a great discipline. I actually had never thought of doing that. And as I start to rack my brain a little bit of, okay, so what metaphors have been used in the past? It's yeah. hard for me to go there because I haven't written them down. Yeah. And so doing that <laughs> seems to be important. Well, and this is what I've done. So I'll share this real quick with you also. Um, I just called it, I mean, it's very, um, very simply titled metaphors I've heard, right? And so I've got, you know, I've reminded myself what the metaphors are. They're moving, seeing, thinking is manipulation, eating. Um, and then I'm looking at like, like how the metaphors show up and how they might be able to be used in things like agreement setting or awareness, but things like movement, like you start to hear things like, it feels like I'm, I keep changing and twisting and pivoting. That is a very movement oriented metaphor. It tells you that it doesn't mean that the client needs to use that language. Like you don't have to like, if you were changing and twisting and pivoting, but you get a sense of this movement, you know, and is the movement like what is useful about the movement or not useful about the movement? It gives us places to explore with the client, right? Um, and again, that you cross a river by feeling the stones, or I need to lean in to receive feedback. People don't think of leaning in as a metaphor, but people use this metaphor all the time. They're leaning in and leaning out from all kinds of things, right? Um, I, I like to go along fine for a while, and then I'm back to where I started. You know, I kind of do a somersault and go back um, to where I started. I've the sun, there was a somersault in there somewhere, and I forgot to write that. Um, I'm the sort of person who goes out of my way to avoid conflicts. What does it mean to go out of your way? What is the service to you of being able to show up if you're moving out of the way of? Right? I feel like I'm a hamster on a wheel. And actually, it was like, I feel like I'm a hamster on a wheel running all the time, but getting nowhere. And my response to that was, you know, he, this was somebody who worked in the tire industry. And I said, what do you do with tires? I mean, do all tires need to be tiny? So you're running really fast. And he's like, oh my God, I'm taking this back to my team. I need a bigger tire um, so that I can use less effort. And I go the same direct, you know, the same distance. I'm still going to be running, but at least I'll get farther, right? Opens up the, a different way of thinking about it. Um, and it's very client centric. It's very client centered. Um, if we move into things like eating, you know, there plates show up everywhere. You will hear plates everywhere because people love overflowing plates. Um, and and this is a, another one. You know, here I have sour grapes if I'm not doing it correctly. Or I just heard this one, you know, it's, it's like, I'm still baking. I'm still in the oven. I feel like I'm not done yet. And I have, you know, and I have a, a bit more to take a bit more time before I'm ready. You know, it's like, it's just beautiful. So like if you're, when you're fully baked, what is that going to be? I mean, like besides just the humor of being fully baked, but I mean, honestly, there's just like, it's fun. And the client then has to think about like, if I am fully baked, what's different about me in that moment? 
how am I showing up different if I'm cooked all the way through versus still being, you know, soft in the middle or doughy or whatever. Um, and somebody just actually, this came up in a coaching session today. I said something, I said something about like, what would you say, you know, if a client were bringing this forward about having this kind of, you know, this sort of situation in their own life. And the response was, are you asking me what the ingredients of permission are? And I said, I didn't know that I was, but now that you've said that, that's the best question I've heard all day. What are the ingredients of permission? Right now we're not looking at like, what do you need to do to give yourself permission? Now we're just looking at ingredients. And that depends probably, right? on the type of permission you need to give, different recipes. Seeing, you know, we don't get to see the big picture. What shifts when you do see the big picture? What would allow you to see a bigger picture? I don't see the path. I mean, I see, a, I see the path. I just don't know how to get on it. Right? That's a really interesting one. So this is a seeing, but it's also trying to get into movement. So we can see the different uh, hemispheres getting or the different regions of the brain. I think what I what feels like the grandiosity of the big vision, like it's paralyzing. <laughs> I mean, you have two different metaphors going on there. You've got the stopping of movement with the grandiosity of this huge vision. What would allow you to have a vision that would also allow you to move? Right? We don't have to stick with just one. We can mix the metaphors that the clients mix for us. Um, and then let's see here. Here's another, like, oh, I keep hearing this. And I recently heard this one too. It's like, I need to get over this hump. What's on the other side of the hump that you need to get to? It's a, and here's the thing about these questions also is I have absolutely no idea what the client's answer is going to be. I am definitely asking questions. I have no idea what the answer is. And that's a big part of coaching. So I'm not leading the client to a particular conclusion. The client is in fact leading me through their thought process. They're creating the dots with these metaphors. I'm asking about them, then they're connecting them. And by the end of it, they own the dots. Those are their dots. They created and connected them and they own them. You know, when I get pushed past my boundaries, I'll stop being nice. What has you getting pushed past your boundaries? Or how do you set a boundary that you feel confident about holding, right? It could be any question. It doesn't matter. There's not like one right one. What about when you think of your boundaries? Like this would be a really good one for the question that was asked earlier about, you know, how do you, you know, if they're really, uh, how do we bring out the metaphor if they are saying something? Boundaries are a metaphor. What's a metaphor? What's an example of a boundary? Walls, bubbles, lines. I mean, these are all metaphors of something, right? So a boundary in and of itself is a metaphor for something. And so we can say, you know, as you're looking at this boundary, what do you see? We're not injecting anything because the client said boundaries. Right? We get to ask questions about that. What are you noticing as you look at this boundary? And what, what has you, like, what has people, what lets people through? What needs to be maybe bolstered up so it's stronger? Where is the boundary really strong and maybe a place where it needs to be a little less strong so that you can, allow, you know, like what's the fluidity of this boundary that you have, right? Like there's all kinds of different places that we can explore there. Um, so, all right, I'm opening up to questions again because we are coming to the top of the hour. Thank you, Michelle, for keeping me on track. I'm looking at metaphors in a very different way now. Great, yeah. And again, you know, um, I have some I have some YouTube videos around these things, but also, you know, this is this is the work that I'm so passionate about. So please always know you can reach out also about this. And we'll be sending everybody, like I said, again, we'll be sending you uh, a LinkedIn message about this. 
But any questions as we're coming to a close or anything that you would like to share about an insight that you're taking away or, uh, or awareness? <laughs> Thank you, Gabriela. <laughs> I do agree that you make it look effortless. And uh, just hearing the different examples, it's like, I miss that. I'm thinking back to, to conversations. I'm like, wow. I'm, I really missed that. So this is incredibly helpful. And I agree, it's something I can apply right away. Yeah. And and I, I mean, I used to miss them all the time. The only reason I don't as much anymore, and I say as much because I still do sometimes, is that I just made it very intentional to pay attention to these things. It's just intentionality. And then really learning how to leverage them because every conversation is gonna be slightly different. And there's no like one hard rule that's gonna work for all of them. Yeah, Shelly, thank you, yeah. And and Philandia, did I pronounce your name right? Philandia. Philanda. Philanda. Philanda, thank you. Sorry, I added an I, I'm dyslexic. I do that sometimes, but uh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And, and Shelly, yeah, using the client's language. I mean, there's nothing more powerful to us as a human being than to feel heard by another human being. And that's the gift we give people when we use their language back to them. Is that sense of really being heard? Yeah, <laughs> you hear that. <laughs> yeah. Anything else anybody's taking away? No? All right. Well, you know how to get in touch with me. We'll be getting in touch with you with the link. Um, please, uh, I look forward to seeing who's going to win. And thank you, gosh, all of you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to work on figuring out how to do the live better next time. So I appreciate your flexibility in moving over to just the Zoom um, so that we could continue to have this. So I appreciate that so very, very much of all of you. So thank you all so much for being here today.